Hi, good afternoon. The sixth chapter features tools, resources, and guidance for serving English learners with disabilities. Next slide, please. Chapter six includes tools intended to help educators in appropriately identifying and serving English learners with disabilities. The tools give examples of how schools can refer, assess, and identify English learners who may have a disability, how to write an individualized education program or plan, or IEP, select accommodations for English learners with disabilities, and how to compare data about English learners with disabilities from one local education agency to another. Awela also published a number of resources on supporting English learners with disabilities in U.S. educational contexts. Along with Awela's resources, this slide also includes resources from the Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP that provide useful information, guidance, and resources for serving English learners with disabilities. The English Learners with Disabilities fact sheet presents data on English learners with disabilities who are enrolled in U.S. schools. It also compares the percentages of English learners and non-English learners who are identified as having a disability and addresses exit rates of English learners and non-English learners with disabilities. Our OSEP fast fact sheets explore our IDA Section 618 data with a specific lens on one of the fastest growing populations of students with disabilities served under the IDEA. OSEP fast fact is an ongoing effort to display data from the 12 data collections authorized under IDEA Section 618 into graphic visual representations with the intent to present our 618 data quickly and clearly. Visit the OSEP Fast Facts page for existing and future Fast Facts. Information Elevated English Learners with Disability Data Visualization explores new data on English learners with disability from the Office of English Language Acquisition's forthcoming by biannual report to Congress, school years 2018 to 2020. This episode also highlights the states with the highest and lowest percentage of English learners with disabilities. The Office of Special Education Ideas That Work website is designed to provide easy access to information from research to practice initiatives funded by OSEP that address the provisions of the IDEA and the ESSA. This website includes resources, links, and other important information relevant to OSEP's research to practice efforts. The OSEP policy letter addresses the inclusion of language development goals in an IEP. The best practices to ensure appropriate instruction throughout the school day and resources for developing IEPs and providing instruction for English learners with disabilities. And finally, the, the non-regulatory Title III guidance provides states and LEAs with information to assist them in meeting their obligations under Title III of the ESEA. To provide supplementary services to English learners, immigrant children and youth and their families, including serving English learners with disabilities. This guidance also provides the public with information about their rights under this law and other relevant laws and regulations. These resources and more can be accessed through the NCELA or, OSEP or the OSEP's website and through all the links on this page. Next slide, please. Chapter six of the English Learner Toolkit provides users guidance for addressing the rights of students with disabilities in school and other educational settings. If an English learner is suspected of having one or more disabilities, the LEA must evaluate the English learner student to promptly determine if the English learner has a disability and whether the English learner needs disability related services which are special education and related services under the IDEA, IDEA, or regular or special education and related aids and services under Section 504. Title III of the ESSA 
requires LEAs to disaggregate English learner data by the number and percentage of English learners with disabilities and reporting on the number and percentage of English learners making progress towards English language proficiency and the number and percentage of former English learners meeting state academic standards for four years after exit. Additional guidance and information on addressing English learners with disabilities are provided in the English Turner Learner Toolkit. We are now going to turn to our panel to discuss this topic further. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the session on English learner students with disabilities. My name is Melissa Escalante. I'm with the Office of English Language Acquisition. Today, we have four wonderful panelists, uh, but in the interest of time, I will introduce all of them very quickly, but please go to the speakers tab on the platform and check out their bios to learn more about each one of them. So welcome to Dr. Caroline Torres, Fran Herbert, Linda Espinosa, and Dr. Lorraine Christensen. So let's get started. Uh, the first question will be led off by Linda and with others chiming in. So what processes ensure that learning differences are identified while honoring linguistic differences? And what processes ensure timely identification for students who are both at risk of disabilities and a possible English learner? All right, so I get to start with this first question. I'm going to take about three to four minutes and then I'm going to pass it to Carrie to add more information. So what does it look like at the district level to look at how do we ensure that the learning differences are identified while still honoring those linguistic differences? Well, first and foremost, we need to look at what policies and procedures we have at the district level that ensure that. And what does the transparency of that look like? So how do we include that equitable framework in all tiers of instruction? Because we all know that ELD instruction is not an intervention, it's a tier one content, but it's also having access to the grade level content throughout the day. So it's not just the 45 minutes, we need to make sure that our ELLs are afforded those linguistic accommodations throughout the whole day. So looking at that, we can then look at, do we have a system, a multi-tier system of support for, EL, for multilinguals? So looking at how does that differentiate? So what we've done in a couple of, of districts is looking at a checklist to ensure that equitability and how we're addressing that. And the first and foremost is that making sure that an ELD specialist is on that team. It's a multidisciplinary team, but the ELD teacher should not be the last one at the table, they should be the first. And a lot of times working and supporting districts as a former director, but also as a consultant, we would have ELD teachers come and say, I didn't even know but my student was being addressed or even looked at. So making sure that we had that equitable framework in all tiers of instruction. And what does that also look like? Making sure that we have language objectives or scaffolds for all the objectives in all tiers of instruction. So looking at that, also IDA tells us that we have to rule out language as the main reason or determiner of that learning barrier or difference or discrepancy. So how do we do that? So very fortunate that Oella's chapter six and specifically looking at tool number two, it helps us and gives us concrete charts that is really the precursor of all trainings in tier one. Making sure that educators that instruct a multilingual can tell the difference between a linguistic issue behavior, a language, behavior and a possible disability behavior. And those concrete examples in tool number two leads you through. They have, th it's wonderful, three columns. It tells you the behavior manifestation. And then we look at what does it look like for a language difference? Well, we only see it in the L2 or the second language that they're adding to their repertoire. We don't see it when, we're, when they're using their L1. So again, we're only seeing it in, in L2, not L1. And then it also makes very clear when you do the training with tool number two, that the possible disability, you see it across languages. 
It's not only going to be seen in one language, it's going to be seen in both. So again, looking at that tool number two is wonderful. And usually in my training that Fran and I do with districts and across the, the state, we look at, do we know the difference? So that's number one. So looking at the learning difference. And then also, uh, what does that imply? That bilingual assessments are going to be needed because we need to know what they know in their native language. If we're doing English only, then we're not really looking at the true, um, I want to say assets of that student. So we need to make sure that we have that in our assessment, both by uh, dual language, but also looking at formative and summative. Because a lot of times we collect data, but are we collecting the correct data and are we asking the right questions? So looking at the next step to rule out language is to look at comparative data to true multilingual peers. That means I'm going to compare apples to apples, L1s, level ones to level ones, level three to level three in the same grade level and also in the, uh, the same program. So we're going to be looking at, is that student that we're, we have concerns about atypical or typical to true multilingual uh, peers? So we do a lot of training on data analysis and collecting the correct uh, data that's language-based first and foremost, but then also content. In Colorado, you know, it might look like, um, Dibbles or iReady, we have a lot of difference, and looking at trend data. So that will help us make sure that we're not over and under identifying. So at this time, I'm going to pass it to Carrie because she wants to talk more about over and under identification. Thanks, Linda. Um, I'll just add briefly. I think something that's also really important for evaluators to be aware of are issues relating to over and under identification in their particular area. This can also be related to um, having an understanding of some cultural differences that may show up in communication patterns and making sure that you're factoring that into your evaluation. We also want to make sure that we're looking at characteristics of our students and looking for things like acculturative stress or trauma or other stressors that students may be experiencing that often can manifest in ways that look like a disability. For example, inattention or lack of focus. Um, and so those are just some other considerations that evaluators should really look into prior to uh, doing their evaluation. Great, thank you. Okay, Lauren, uh, this question goes off to you. Uh, we know that ELs are more likely to be identified with a specific learning disability and speech or language impairment and less likely to be identified with other health impairment, autism, and emotional disturbance as compared to all school-aged children served under IDIA. What are some of the ways we can review our processes to make sure that the right students are receiving the services that they need? Sure, thank you so much for that question. And I know that uh, Fran and Carrie also uh, are going to jump in on this one as well. Um, you know, much of my work at WIDA is focused on multilingual learners with the most significant cognitive disabilities as we work to update our alternate access, which is an alternate assessment for this population of students. So I want to talk a little bit about multilingual learners with significant cognitive disabilities in general in relation to this question. I think it's really important to start with the individual student and really think about the kinds of needs that they're bringing with them. So thinking about not just their disability related needs, which I think are often the focus for this group of students, right? Um, they often have some complex disability related needs. And so largely I think schools focus on those needs, but in reality, these students also have language related needs that uh, we do need to address. And I think that that can be um, challenging sometimes because these students may also have some communication challenges. And so one of the things I think we really need to do is also start with communication, making sure that the student has um, an appropriate way to communicate um, so that the adults around are able to understand. Um, you know, the communication barrier is really with us more than it is with the student, um, but making sure that students have augmentative and alternative communication devices 
um, you know, and those devices need to be available in not only the language used at school, which of course is often English, but they also need to be used, they need to be developed um, to have the student's home language and any other languages that they may um, also use as well. So I think that's really critical. Um, those devices need to be able to go home so that students are able to develop more facility with uh, the communication tools that they have. So I think that that is um, really critical uh, to develop the communication in order for us uh, to better understand how to serve uh, multilingual learners who have significant cognitive disabilities. I would also just add that addressing accessibility and accommodations for instruction is really critical too. And finally, I think um, my last point um, on this particular question is that really collaborative planning is really important. We know that uh, many students who have of significant cognitive disabilities spend much of their day in self-contained special education classrooms and it's really critical for them to be in general education classrooms as well um, to spend time um, with their peers um, and so I just really think that having some collaborative planning with general education teachers, special education teachers, as well as, of course, English language development teachers at the forefront um, is really critical um, for this particular group of students. And as we are able to address the students' needs, I think that we um, can do a better job of identifying these students. So um, I know, Fran, you had some additional points you wanted to make on this question as well. So I'll turn it to you. Thank you. I'm going to specifically talk about uh, specific learning disabilities, or SLD, and speech language impairments, SLI. And these two areas, uh, or eligibility categories, account for the highest in amongst our second language learning students. For specific learning disabilities, it's approximately 45% identification rate. And for sp uh, speech language impairment, it's about 19%. And this came from a recent OSEP uh, 2022 resource that I was reading. So it certainly goes to what uh, Carrie spoke about overrepresentation of L's. Um, so when we're looking at ELLs and we're trying to rule out either a learning disability or a speech language impairment, we need to really ask ourselves, are we identifying the appropriate students for the referral to SPED as Linda addressed? And are we uh, assessing them correctly? And of course, are we including the family as part of the decision-making team? So some of the things that I want to emphasize here uh, about um, eligibility criteria or how do we get to a true eligibility uh, of a disability is we need to sometimes uh, understand that a lot of our assessment teams are not knowledgeable in second language acquisition. They're not differentiating between a language difference and a true disability or language dominance. And Linda spoke to that a little bit. But again, it bears repeating. The other thing, especially with speech language impairments are, uh, and I'm a speech pathologist by background, not all speech pathologists are familiar with uh, discourse patterns or phonemic repertoires of the first language influencing or transferring to the second language that may disguise themselves as a disability. Um, and then lastly, I really want to talk about uh, cultural and linguistic assessment bias, okay? We really need to understand that assessments content, materials, the language in which questions questions are phrased, the scoring criteria, the reliability and validity of the assessment being used are full of cultural biases. Even the nonverbal assessments that we give, we use language to give directions. So there's that culture. Uh, a real uh, quick example was I observed an assessment being given and it was a student uh, that uh, was Muslim, and the assessment person was saying, show me pork. Culturally inappropriate. Um, the other thing, too, that I want to talk about assessments that I started to do when I was in the district as a speech language pathologist was there's a lot of um, literature there on translanguaging. 
I was using translanguaging to assess. So in giving an assessment, if I was giving it in English and the student was Spanish speaking, um, my first language is Spanish, I would ask that question in Spanish and many of the times the student was able to answer it. Now, that was correct. Unfortunately, I invalidated the test that I was giving, but in my report, in my feedback to the team, I was then able to say disabilities do not occur in linguistic silos. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Disabilities are not occurring in linguistic silos. In order, as Linda alluded to earlier, too, is those manifested behavior difficulties uh, have to occur in the first language as well as the second language and any other languages that are being spoken. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, speech language impairments, again, I really just want to emphasize that transference or influence of phonemic repertoires, discolors patterns in the first language impacting and being misunderstood for uh, disabilities. Real quick, I want to give a couple of resources that I have found really useful. The American Speech and Hearing Association is really good. They have about 40, maybe even more now, phonemic repertoires of the most common languages spoken in the world that SLPs can access or individuals in the audience that may not necessarily be members of ASHA. And secondly, Doreen Gonzalez came up with the 15 bilingual phenomena. And transference is one of those, which is what I spoke to earlier, the L1 phonemic repertoire discourse patterns transferring into L2. Carrie, I don't know if you would like to add something else or Lauren? I think in the interest of time, I'll save my my comments for a later question. I think you covered it pretty well. Thank yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Question number three, and Fran will lead us off on this one with others chiming in. Uh, question. What are some of the best practices and effective strategies for supporting English learner students with disabilities? I can't emphasize enough, and I really want to start off with emphasizing that the development of the individual education program or the IEP has to be a collaborative effort. There has to be multiple data uh, included in the uh, IEP that describes and substantiates the need for specialized instruction. So we've gone through already the comparative data, we've uh, the uh, intervention progress monitoring data, the assessment of special education, and we've taken all that data and triangulated it, and it should be supporting the difficulties that the classroom teacher or the parents are reporting to us that they see the student having difficulty with. Um, I, I really can't emphasize this includes ELD, the general ed teacher, the SPED assessment team, the interventionists, but sometimes we really forget about the families, including the families uh, or a cultural mediator that may be hired by the district. Uh, in terms of, in your culture, would this be a familiar discourse pattern, et cetera? Is, is this the word that is used in your culture? Keeping in mind that in Spanish, and I'm a native Spanish speaker, there are eight major regional dialects of Spanish. So if I go to Spain and visit family there, it takes me a day to acclimate to the intonation, the stress patterns, pronunciation, et cetera. And then I, I want to turn now to uh, IEP goals. We're all familiar, or some of us may be familiar with the acronym SMART goals. The SMART goals are specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're results driven and related to the area of need of the student. And they're also time bound for a year, the student hopefully will accomplish that goal. But for L's that have been duly identified, we really need to make them smarter goals. In other words, we need to make them linguistically relevant. So smarter goals, I added the E, what does that mean? How do I, as a special education service provider, continue to enhance the student's English language proficiency? Well, I am part of that team that works with the student. I need to collaborate with the ELD staff. 
And then the R is how do I make it relevant to or related to the level of English language proficiency that the student has that I'm working with? And uh, I do that by incorporating some of the WIDA language functions and scaffolds. And um, this is something that I think is exciting because I'm seeing a lot more uh, conversations about in making IEP goals more re linguistically relevant for our L students that are duly identified. And I don't know, Carrie, or Lauren, uh, if you wanted to add anything else to that, I wanted to make sure that we had time. Well, I just want to jump in since you just mentioned the WIDA standards and say that I do think that um, it's really important uh, with our multilingual learners with disabilities um, to make sure that we are looking at our language development standards and really working collaboratively with general education teachers to tease out what are the linguistic elements of uh, the lesson and helping the student be able to access the content through the work with the language um, the ELD teacher. I think that's really critical. And so having additional um, support for our students with disabilities to also be thinking about um, how to best differentiate, differentiate and individualize instruction for them. I think, um, you know, this is uh, very much a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback on that, Lauren, it's, it's critical because um, we all have a separate when I say we all have ELD staff, general ed, special ed, we have uh, separate personnel, policies, and funding sources. And these different funding sources and um, roles that we play can add to furthering those silos. Mm -hmm. So what happens then is if we're not collaborating and making an effort to, you know, really get in there, uh, is we're providing siloed services, disconnected services to the student. And sometimes that can be more detrimental than helpful. So I ask myself, I wonder some of those children that I served many years ago and didn't do the collaboration or the appropriate IEP development, did I add to them stagnating or not? And I often wonder if I should be suing myself. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, uh, just a few minutes left. Um, so I'll th pitch the last question. Uh, what are some of the effective evidence and research-based practices that support better outcomes for English learners with uh, English learner students with disabilities? So uh, feel free anyone to jump in there and take that question. Thank you. I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, this is a huge question. We could spend all day on it, um, but I want to just touch briefly on three things that I think can really amplify what's in the Chapter 6 guidelines. The first is using an asset focus when we're working with our learners. The second is really ensuring we're aligning our support to their specific, specific disabilities, needs, and challenges. And the third is that we're using a culturally relevant framework. So as Fran noted, the, provision, the IEP is essential because it guides the provision of special education services. So even beginning with that process and carrying through into our instruction, it's essential that we use an asset focus with our students, honoring their backgrounds, their strengths, their preferences, as well as identifying potential challenges and supports. When parents are talked about IEP meetings and they often report that they feel really disconnected and not collaborative when there's an extensive deficit focus on their learners. So one way we can begin to do this is by designing through a universal design for learning framework, which calls on us to examine our curriculum and instruction and identify potential barriers in the curriculum and instruction rather than situating that within the students. So to reduce the potential barriers, there are many practices that are supportive for stu students with disabilities, but they typically depend on the specific disability. As multilingual learners, students with disabilities are also really um, 
heterogeneous and even students diagnosed with the same disability may have very different strengths and challenges. So one example is strategies like chunking information, breaking information into smaller segments so that the student can focus more on one specific piece of information or one piece of a task and practice that before adding on. That can be really helpful for students who struggle with working memory. And this can come along with attention uh, deficit disorder, even emotional behavioral disorders or other learning disabilities can tax the working memory. For multilingual learners with disabilities, they also are using more resources from their working memory because any of the language features that are not automated, like grammar, vocabulary, et cetera, also pull those resources. So they may mo need more robust supports. In addition, collaborative strategies are that are combined with explicit modeling and explicit strategy instruction have been shown to be effective for multilingual learners with disabilities, like collaborative strategic reading or self-regulated strategy development in writing. The explicit instruction and modeling with scaffolds like graphic organizers and mnemonics for memory aids paired with structured collaboration provides additional opportunity for students to also build their oral language development and social skills. These strategies also include elements of self-regulation, which many learners with disabilities struggle with, and this can help make some of those invisible processes visible for the students and help them de develop those strategies. The final thing I will mention, because I think we're almost out of time, is that these specific supports should be delivered through a culturally relevant and culturally sustaining framework for instruction. This has even been shown through research to really improve outcomes for multilingual learners with learning disabilities, particularly in reading. When the content is culturally relevant, the learners are better able to access and engage with that content as they leverage and draw on their backgrounds and their funds of knowledge to help understand and build meaning through that. I could talk about this all day, but I see our timekeeper. So I'm going to pause. And if there's any remaining time, if any of our other panelists want to jump in briefly. Yeah, I wish we had some time. Um, I can tell you by the, you know, just from what we hear in the field um, through Owella and I'm sure OSEP as well. And then of course the questions and comments that are coming through the chat. I mean, this is really a hot uh, topic. Uh, for our stakeholders. So ladies, I appreciate um, your uh, information and sharing your uh, expertise with us. And thank you so much. And I'll pass it to Jen. Great. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you again to our panelists. What a good conversation. Lots of practical tips that we can take back and tailor for our particular instructional context. Um, so just a reminder, we will have our next session that's beginning shortly. That starts at Eastern time. 3.35, so um, a little stretch break right now, um, between now and then. Um, if you don't need a stretch break, you can always go check out the resources and the ways to collaborate with your, um, with your colleagues here who are taking part in this meeting. Thanks so much. <laughs>